Okay, I call this meeting to order and uh, welcome to our July 10th and this is our fifth meeting of the Annexation Task Force and we're going to get started with an introduction of the task force members starting with Tina down on my right. Tina Haroldson, uh, South Louise. Greg Neitzert, Sioux Falls City Council, Northwest District. Matt Metzger, South Sycamore Avenue. And I'm Council Member Rick Kiley. Marshall Selberg, Sioux Falls City Council. Greg Starnes, uh, Cactus Heights. Jeff Davis, Prairie Meadows. Okay, thank you. And again, thank you for your commitment to this task force and, and the time that it has required of you. Um, just very briefly, as I have done at other me meetings, the goals here, once again, is to develop recommendations on how to best address the unannexed pockets of land with city limits. The recommendations resulting from this process may impact annexation of land not currently surrounded by city land as well. And as we've stated throughout the entire process, this task force was not formed to address any particular property, any individual property, or any individual subdivision but rather we're trying to develop uh, recommendations that we can then give to the city administration that would guide them in the process uh, of annexation. Uh, and so tonight we're gonna be focusing on the process of how city staff will determine when to initiate uh, discussions with property owners and then I would uh, venture to guess that our next meeting in August uh, will be focusing on what type of improvements and, and financing would be available uh, in annexations if they are deemed to be necessary. And I again emphasize the word if they are deemed to be necessary. All of this would be going forward to the uh, would be forwarded to the Sioux Falls City Council, the full City Council. Uh, this is just an advisory group. Uh, the recommendations of this task force will ultimately be decided by the Sioux Falls City Council members. Okay, the first item uh, on our agenda this evening, and we are going to uh, attempt to stop promptly at our seven o'clock deadline this evening, but our first uh, item uh, is a discussion, discuss annexation policy recommendations and criteria. And uh, Director Mike Cooper uh, is going to be leading the task force. Most of this is going to be discussion on the part of the task force, but Mr. Cooper will, will kind of lead us with some key points. And then we will pause uh, in this, so we will break from our normal formality where Normally in the past, we've waited for the entire presentation to, to take place. In this case, it's going to be more fitting to address each topic individually once he's addressed it. So we'll open it to questions as we go. Director Great. Cooper. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Mike Cooper with the City Planning and Building Services. Uh, tonight, what we wanted to focus on, is, as Councilor Kiley stated, is to begin more of an interaction or dialogue with the task force members um, to, be, to look at how city staff would begin discussions with, with property owners, under what type of conditions would those discussions be uh, initiated. And then again, in the August meeting, what we'd like to focus on is that when property might be annexed, particularly property that's already developed, what type of minimum standards would be required to be phased in over time and how those financial impacts could be addressed. So that's kind of what we have in mind uh, between now and, and next month. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna go through a series of slides. I'm gonna try to go through a series of slides. Is this not functioning? That are based on uh, questions that have been raised from previous presentations and also some talking points that even have been suggested by some of the task force members. So let's start out by uh, reminding all of us on how annexation can happen. Uh, this is the flowchart that 
that we've used. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that we have that process that a property owner or a group of property owners have the ability to petition the city to voluntarily request annexation. Uh, that ultimately goes to the city council for consideration. And that's how property is, is typically added into the city limits. On the right-hand side of the flow chart would be the process where the city staff would go out and start discussions with a property owner or a group of property owners. And that could end up as a voluntary petition. Uh, it could end up as a pre-annexation agreement. And we'll talk more about what that might include in the future. Or it could involve um, an annexation study if there was a compelling reason why the city felt that it was important to, to bring that site into the corporate limits. And again, all of those different steps would ultimately have to go through city council for final determination. So again, this is a, an overview of the different ways that, that we can annex property or that we can at least initiate discussions about potential annexation of property. Um, one of the things that we talked about last time uh, was how should the city proceed if a voluntary annexation request results in an unannexed pocket of property. Uh, this graphic is intended to kind of show on the left-hand side, um, a petition would come in that is contiguous to the city limits. Um, in the middle, the same, there would be another petition that would come in but there would be a, a gap in the city limits. And then the third example would be a voluntary petition would come in and that would result in a pocket or an island. Um, the task force members, based on some of our previous conversations and some of your input, have suggested that probably we should not make any changes to the current policy other than let's try to make an effort of contacting the property owners around the annexation petition about the, the possibility of joining that petition or at least looking at some type of future annexation schedule. So again, I'm, I'm going to stop at each one of these slides so that you as a task force can have some discussion about that. Excuse me, can I, can I ask you to back up to your first slide? You bet. Okay, when you get... Uh... So you have annexation in the very top box um, for city, an if, and then you move over to city initiated. That study, it would have seemed to me, if we're looking for recommendations, which I know you are, uh, that study should almost be up at the top. In other words, how do you do? Are you just looking at a map and you say now you have 62 areas that aren't in the city? Uh, to, in other words, would it make more sense if uh, you had? A group within the city that reviewed each of those areas physically, you know, drive around, uh, and, and the study gave a reason for it being yep. up on the annexation. We're going we're to, if, if I could, we're going to come to a specific slide that addresses your question. Thank you. This is just kind of a recap of, of all the different options that we could go through. Okay. But we're going to come back to these in more detail. I trust I you very much. You. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So again, the question would be, do you believe as a task force that we should modify our policy regarding voluntary annexations? So Director Cooper, when it says no changes other than making an effort of con contacting that property owner, we're not doing that at this point in the, as part of the process? Uh, we haven't been contacting all the surrounding property owners, but what we have been doing in a couple of recent cases is asking the property owner if they've made contact with the adjoining property or if they are doing it in phases. You know, they may be uh, the property owner that's only requesting partial annexation at this time. Okay. So we have kind of started doing this to some degree already. Okay. Just a couple of real quick housekeeping things. Uh, task force members, if you wish to keep uh, the, the slide on the screen, make sure your TV is set to HDMI, HDMI 1. And you can do that with the remote that's in front of you by pushing the TV button. You'll also see it states mode 
below it, and you can just kind of switch through the different selections there. Uh, otherwise, that slide is going to appear and disappear periodically. So if you wish to have it in front of you at all times, you can do that. And then one other thing, too, as we go through these, the TFM does stand for Task Force Member Suggestion. And so in this case, this, this suggestion came from one of our task force members. Okay, enough of the housekeeping. So, can I get, so when we say no changes to current policy, we're just at this point talking about the notification policy. Yes. An unannex, okay. Yep. And, and also, uh, as we talked before, should we, if a voluntary petition's coming in, and it's gonna create one of those scenarios in the middle or the right, should we have a policy of holding up that voluntary annexation? And I think what we heard before was probably not, but. I, I would agree with that. That's but what I, we're I think, I think the pocket should be contacted as soon as possible. Okay. Does it just take, does it take more, how many residents does it take to request a voluntary? I mean, if I call and say, well, I want, I want annexed, does that trigger the process? Okay, a voluntary petition has to be 70, that's 75 percent rule. So there, everybody would, you've had meetings and by the time it gets yep. down to that vote, like you have in Prairie Meadows, we've had about, what, 20 meetings about that. Well, you know. okay. Typically a voluntary petition comes in by a developer or, or one or two property owners saying we want to be annexed. Okay. So what we're asking for is when that comes in, should the city initiate discussions with the other surrounding property owners that that might be adjacent to this or might be um, in a pocket or an island. Most definitely. And I think what you're saying is yes, we should do that. And that has been the bigger issue, if I can just try to give a little more clarity to this, this it's when developers are requesting uh, annexation and then it does create one of these pockets that you see here illustrated. But technically it could be one property owner if it's yep. one individual property owner, but the pockets that have concerned the city council uh, which then leads to uh, the issues surrounding annexation are, are what we're trying to eliminate as much as possible or at least reduce uh, the occurrence of the pockets. And so that's, that's the purpose of this. But it's generally from developers that are requesting to be annexed so that they can then plot the land and develop it. Or it could come from a neighborhood too, potentially. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to also suggest that we not only have two different ways an annexation can start, but we have two different kinds of property owners. We have people with property they want to develop, and we have people that are just residential, and they're just living in that property. So in this example, if the developer, in the, the third example, if the developer moves to annex and that's a single property owner, that's that pocket, it would seem to me that might be a good time to try to negotiate something with that developer if he wants to annex to potentially alleviate some of the strain on that private property owner to pay for everything. If he wants to be annexed that bad, maybe he'd be willing to help run a line over or, or do something else to help the individual and at that point you wouldn't have a pocket if it's a win-win situation. Okay. Any other comments from task force members? Councillor Neitzer. Yeah, I, I think that's that's great and a discussion would be good. I, I would just throw out that I, I wouldn't want to, I mean, I don't, don't, doesn't sound like anybody is proposing this to stop annexation because we might create a pocket. In a perfect world, we wouldn't create pockets, but over on my west side of town, you've got developers that are annexing 50 acres at a time, a tract of land to develop a housing subdivision, and they would love to to purchase and many times they make multiple attempts at purchasing a property that's adjacent to it and the landowner won't sell for a, a number of reasons yeah. and sometimes there, there's one over on the west side of town where uh, the the developers are making overtures to this particular landowner but this landowner is strategically holding out and waiting for that area to develop betting on the fact that as it develops around him the land is going to be a lot more valuable and you can't make him sell no. But it, and, and, and I wouldn't want to just hold up all of the development on the west side because we've got one farmstead who doesn't want to sell. So Correct. that's a really that's a that's a that's a huge problem. But the, on the other hand, um, the developer wants it annexed to make a profit. The and that's okay. 
the guy that bought the land as investment land a few years ago, but basically all they have, they just haven't been able to agree on a price. You know, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna develop 60 acres, and somebody's got four acres that's in your way, you can probably anticipate paying 15 acre price for it. Business is business. True. There's some very heavy uh, platting fees that will be paid, and sometimes people who are selling property don't understand what developers have to pay. To I, I understand, so. but they're not paying that landowner. They're paying. Yeah, but you know, I'm I understand. Just, I understand what you're saying, but I'm also understanding that the right of the one per and and people and and it, I agree with you that it's it's a huge problem, but you can't. Uh, and you're not going to stay if you're one person with four acres. 20 years ago, my own father-in-law had four and a half acres at 48th and Klein. Uh, eventually, it got swallowed up. Um, um, in your, in Tina's case, what she was talking about, uh, the developer took good care of him with sidewalks, curb and gutter, and all that kind of stuff. There's more than one way to, but I hear what you're saying. But the, on the other side, you have to protect. If a guy's got 10 acres, what do you do? So. The guy, if, if a developer wants to develop 200 acres and there's somebody that owns 10, it's his 10 acres, you know. It's um, suggesting we respect individual property rights. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying don't get excited if the guy wants three prices for his land because he's going to pay it, you know, and it's the way it is. Any other comments from the task force? Now, just to recap here, if I can, uh, it seems like the consensus is that uh, to make no change to the current policy, but uh, whenever possible, as Tina had mentioned, to contact the other landowner, or if it's the same landowner, uh, and negotiate with them uh, regarding that pocket of land, or at least give them the heads up at that time uh, regarding the implications of becoming a pocket and what that could mean to them in the future. And at the same time, you have the right, if, if, somebody's, being, if somebody's being totally unreasonable, I want $200,000 an acre, or I'm not selling. And then you have the right to, the city has the right to begin a forced annexation. Director we'll, Cooper. We'll get to that one. Yeah. Director Cooper, okay. if um, an individual, if, if the property is currently being used for ag, they could be annexed, and the zoning could remain ag, and they could continue operations. Is that not correct? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And that's the that's the typically what we see most often. Yep. Did you get enough clarity yeah. on that one? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to start talking about. Now the title of this side slide says city initiated annexations, but it's more of a city initiated annexation discussion. So this is question number two. How should the city of Sioux Falls um, start initiating discussions with properties, property owners, neighborhoods? Um, and I'm going to go on the right hand side is what historically we, we have been doing. You know, that's how we put together that chart or that map of the 60 some areas. And we have just kind of determined what the top five would be that we would start to go out and, and meet with each year. And, and that, has, that has said, okay, we're gonna put together a predetermined list and then each year we're gonna use that list to go out and start meeting with property owners, with neighborhoods to talk, talk about uh, the growth of the city, potential annexation, potential time frames, those kind of things. Uh, the other option that we'll talk more about tonight would be should there be triggers and we're using the term trigger should there be triggers that would um, determine when we would start having these discussions with property owners or with neighborhoods by trigger you're referring to certain conditions yes so i'm going to start going through some of the triggers uh, because, again, we don't have to have an answer to this right now. But these, these following slides uh, give you some idea of triggers that have been brought up or that have been discussed that could be used to identify 
the properties the city should initiate discussions with. So let me go back. I know I'm going through this fast. So as we go through the discussion tonight, we're looking for some input from the task force on if we should continue the process on the right-hand side of the slide or if we should modify that process to look at triggers or if we're going to end up with some type of a combination of the two. So let's start talking about these triggers. And these are in no particular order of priority or, or importance. But number one is what we talked about before. You have a situation where land is surrounded, um, the unannexed property, by a certain amount of development. And so the, the question would be, what percentage of land development would potentially trigger um, that the city would start initiating discussions with a property owner? Is it 50%? Is it 100%? So the question that we're posing to you as a task force would give us some guidance on if we're going to use this as, as a trigger, one of many triggers, what should be the requirement in terms of development around that property? And I don't necessarily have to have an answer tonight, but I would like to at least have some discussion as we go through each one of these. Well, uh, very good. Well, I'll throw out, I mean, I think, in my opinion, on each one of these triggers, I'm going to say, yes, that's a trigger. I think, I think whatever results in the earliest conversation with the neighborhood is the best policy. So to me, it's, it's 20, if 25%, if one side, if the city limits is, a, is a, a budding a property, and it, or maybe 50%, but um, it seems to me the city needs to be talking to these neighborhoods sooner than later. The other thing, I have a, if you've got, you've got uh, 62 areas that, uh, that are targeted, uh, what, what, how did you prioritize those, or how are those prioritized? Because, I mean, has somebody done more than look at a map and saw that it was surrounded by three sides, two sides, one side? I mean, has somebody driven around each one of those and, and put them in number order, which one really needs the annexation or which one would be beneficial to the city? There, I, I just think it's got to be more than a map. Is that, is that I'm yep. sure that you do. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this slide. Okay. On the right-hand side is what we have been doing. And the way that we came up with those priorities in the past is we looked at those that are adjacent to the city limits, those that have development around them, uh, those that we think would be in the path of development within the next three to five years. That's kind of how we have prioritized them in the past, right. to go out and begin discussions. So I guess where I'm at, where I'm at is if be, I'm in business, okay, I'm in business. I need to do 10 things to improve my business. I've got to pick, pick the, but I can only afford to do six of them. How do I decide which six to do? do you, are you looking at the improvements in those neighborhoods and saying, well, this one's pristine? Or are you over in my neighborhood and saying, geez, Jeff, you need something? You know, I mean, it's got to be more, Mike, than, uh, than just, uh, it's touching on one side. You like the one, the one, your one ideal is that you, the one idea that you said, if it's getting in the way of some development, if, uh, if you're needing to put a sewer line through or you're needing to do, change a highway for traffic patterns. Yep. I understand that. That's a true trigger. Okay. But I'm wondering, why, are, why aren't these areas earmarked in order of priority based on the needs that we're aware of? So what you're recommending, believe it or not, is that we should go from the right-hand side of this chart to the left-hand side and use triggers to determine what those priorities are. That's exactly right. Okay. So any more discussion about the one pertaining to development around an annex property? Mm -hmm. I heard roughly 50% might be a starting point. Again, we're not, uh, what we're saying is that these triggers would allow us to go out and begin discussions. Discussions is the key word, okay? All right. You know, can I, can I just follow up though on Jeff's point? It seems to me that a, a city list is a good thing. I mean, they're, 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 you know things, you know things that are coming up. You know an area that may be uh, in the path of development, even though no area at all is touching it. So, I mean, I, I yep. think 
it needs to be a combination of, of triggering events and and the judgment of the city. And, and, and we're not talking about a forced annexation or, or not we're at just all. talking about talking, getting out and t starting talking. Planning. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we've, we've heard from two out of seven members and I think in order to r really reach a consensus it would be to our advantage if we hear from more of you on each of these topics as we move forward even if you want to say I did owe that at least we do know where you're where you're at on that so uh, if I can maybe move you a little out of your comfort zone uh, who would like to go next no I agree I th the earlier you can do this the better because I think in my case we all know what happened I found out the day of the city council meeting I was being annexed into the city. So I think at any point there's discussion of annexing land around your property, that's when the discussion needs to start. And so these triggers as we go through them would help us determine yeah. at what point that would start? If. Okay. So in my case, Ronning bought the land around my house and whenever that was going to the city to be annexed in, that's when I would have liked to have been contacted. And I'm not saying we need to decide anything, but at least we start the process, yep. in my opinion. Yep. But it's Councilor more than Knight. communication and awareness. More communication. Okay. Exactly. Councillor Nicer. I, I would ditto that. Since we're only talking about communication, once, once an annexation occurs that has property touching me, I think it's time to start. Okay. Well, and again, I think we need to be sensitive to landowners because landowners aren't developers. And landowners, landowners don't know and or understand all of these things. Just because somebody buys the land next to you doesn't mean that you realize why they bought it. You're, you have a life, you're busy, you're raising your kids, you're doing other stuff. It sneaks up on you. Yep. Sure. Yeah, the earlier the, no the notice and the communication obviously is the better, like you said. I mean, you don't want to run into any more of the deals like Matt had run into or especially ridiculous you hear the, on the day of. But yeah, I, I guess I'm saying a ditto as well. Whatever opens the line of communication as soon as possible. And, and I would agree as well, too. The sooner that we can begin the communication, it, it seems like that's the consensus, the better. So this kind of ties into the, the first trigger. Um, and this came from the task force as well, that if there's an existing rural development that's contiguous to the city, but with very little development around the site, the city should provide information about annexation to the property owners so they can begin planning for the future. So it doesn't say that we're gonna begin the annexation process, but we're gonna begin the communication and the discussion with them. Okay. And very good. Any thoughts any, or comments about that? Any comments? And this, I know this came from one of you, and thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas and following up on the assignment that I had given you at the last meeting, so that is appreciated. But any further thoughts or comments? So again, the, the, in the scenario, we would go out to neighborhood X or property owner Y, and we would say, you know, here's what the future growth area of the city's looking like. We might talk about some future capital improvements over the next five to 10 years. Uh, just those kind of general high-level discussions is how we would typically start those communications. Okay. I don't see any other discussion okay. on that. Um, another trigger would be that the city utilities are connected to or adjacent to or available to the unannexed property. And we've talked in the past presentations that we have different scenarios where unannexed property is uh, tied to city services through previous agreements or that through some of our capital improvement projects we know that there's going to be city utilities going uh, forward adjacent to unannexed property. So again this would be another trigger that would say if this is the situation then the city staff should start going out and meeting or talking to these property owners. So this, a, that's a complex, um, you could apply that standard to a lot of different places, but uh, that's, that's where I believe a really a careful review. Um, if, the, if, the pro, if, if the surrounded area or that's adjacent, adjacent to or available to 
are pretty broad terms. Um, you guys are geniuses about building stuff, so you can make it available to almost anybody. So, well, if you're talking about water and sewer, there's a process. That there's a process. I understand, but it's, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is, is I think the first thing and my main recommendation for this deal is, uh, is to have people, uh, a team of five or whatever, your experts, to, to, to have actually a physical review and see, you know, establish a need. And it, even though, I guess that wouldn't be. I guess I wouldn't want this to be a trigger that you uh, that would just automatic well this is it we're going to do it because you know what I mean okay. so you've been very reasonable so far Councillor Neitzer I, I guess kind of tagging off what uh, Jeff had said just the word available because when we build Basin 15 in 2020 presumably sewer might be available to somebody out by Wall Lake if we run the pipe long enough so I guess Maybe it should be within so many feet or adjacent or as long as what, what, what does available mean to you, I guess? Available means that if it was annexed, we would be able to serve that property within two years. Okay. It's a two within to three two year timeline yeah. is what kind of our standard is. I, I, I think a, a person really needs to be careful of that trigger. Okay. Yeah, because, because basically what happens is, is and we're talking about annex and people. We're not talking about just dirt. And uh, and I know how you are. You guys are good. I've worked, been working with you on our problem for years, and it's it's very reasonable. But but I guess what I'm saying is is in one hand, uh, these everybody's suspicious of this or suspicious of that. So when you say it's available, uh, if I'm Jeff Davis tonight, I'm saying I would trust you not to use that against me. Yep. But if you were gone and I was gone and the city attorney was standing there and they wanted that area and well, it's available. So the example that we're showing up on the chart or the graphic would be that we're going to be extending a water and sewer line um, along an area that will be adjacent to unannexed property. So that's what this example is trying to show. So in that situation, should we go out and initiate discussions with that property owner or those property owners to let them know about that? I'd say the answer would be yes. So that, that puts it in a little different yes, it perspective does. than yeah. just a yeah, and I And I'm not trying to yeah. plant seeds of mistrust. Don't misunderstand me. Yep. Have we been doing any of that up to this point? Uh, we, in the past, we have done some of it, but we haven't always probably been as aggressive as we could. Um, and this, this goes back to the discussion about trying to coordinate the capital improvement program um, with property that's either in or out of the city. So all that we're saying here is that if we're doing a water sewer utility project that's gonna have some impact potentially of unannexed property, should we initiate those discussions? I most definitely think you should because that's one of our Prairie Meadows problems is we, okay. we should have been, this could have been taken care of 10, 15 years ago, you know, with the right uh, connection. Director Cooper, is there a point in time when uh, the infrastructure is being installed, construction is actually taking place to put in the utilities, the city uh, water, the, the sewer and so on? that it would actually be advantageous for the adjacent property owner to hook up because it would reduce the costs associated with the hookup. Yeah, depending on the situation, there is that potential. That's something that we would have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. But yeah, there is that potential. So then that would seem to suggest that the time uh, to initiate discussion would be before the infrastructure work is, yeah. even begins. Yes. Otherwise, that option is fleeting. Any other thoughts on any any part of the discussion? That makes sense. Did you get I got the consensus notes. on that? Yes. So again, um, kind of going back to Tina's issue that you know you're in some cases you're talking about vacant land that's agricultural. In other cases, you're talking about existing rural development. So. Again, this, this was a, an idea from the task force 
If an existing rural development is contiguous to the city and is generally urban in character, which means that the, uh, the property owners maybe have some city services already, then we would do more of an annexation study to determine the infrastructure needs. And I think that would go back to more the Prairie Meadows example. So this would, be, this would allow us to ensure the proper coordination of sewer water or other improvements that might be desirable. So I think, again, the point is a trigger of city utility improvements would be one that we would use to begin discussions with property owners in these situations. Okay. I think that's the consensus right. that, I, that I see here. Um, trigger number three, and this kind of gets back to what we've been talking about already. Um, we have a five-year capital improvement program that's approved by the city council each year. And those can include utility projects, they can include street projects, there might be a neighborhood park, there might be a fire station, whatever. So we know that these CIP projects are going to be moving forward um, at least a year or two, sometimes three years ahead of time. So the trigger in this case potentially could be a CIP project is going to be constructed adjacent to an unannexed property within the next three years. Uh, this is a little bit of a repeat of one that we just talked about, but it just kind of gets back to that discussion of when we get the CIP document approved each year and we look at that and we can start to go out and identify potential properties or neighborhoods that are going to be impact, impacted by some of these capital projects, would that be a trigger that we would schedule some of those discussions or meetings with those property owners uh, well ahead of those capital projects getting started. Is that something that's already goes into your analysis on whether they, they're on a predetermined list? Uh, we haven't done as much of that on a formal basis, but again, when we, when we came up with our massive map that showed all of those, we did take this into consideration in some cases especially the ones that are closer into the city limits. So I'm hearing that this is probably a Council good trigger to use. Councillor Neitzer? Well, so the only thing that I would, I would wonder if we should think about is, as you know, when we approve the CIP, it's a roadmap. Really only the first year is somewhat binding, as it were. Sometimes Project. projects farther out yeah. might slip a year in yep. the next CIP. So. You know, do we just start discussions with things that we know are coming the next year, or do we do it with all of everything for the next five years? I mean, more time is better, but things do slip and sometimes even get deleted. I mean, that, that happens too. But it doesn't hurt to start the conversation. The only thing is, if we give you all these triggers, I don't know if you have enough staff to call all these people. I mean, this you know, it could be a lot of different, a lot of different properties. So. So do you think three years is too far out? Maybe it should be more like two years. Three years may be okay, but okay. Just, just knowing that obviously, as you know, sometimes things yeah. might slip, but yeah, it's not the end around. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is the, it is the middle of our current CIP yeah. plan of five years, basically. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. kind of a compromise there in terms of time. Plus it gives people more awareness, as we've heard from you, um, more time to think about what the future might be, whether they want to change something or not. So, okay. Absolutely. Um, another scenario with an unannexed property is situated along an existing improved street. Um, would this be a trigger that we would go out and talk to those property owners um, along with some of the other triggers that we've already gone through? And this is a scenario where the, let's say an arterial street has already been improved. Um, whatever that arterial street might be. It could be a 41st Street, it could be a Sycamore, it could be whatever street you want to identify. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, we didn't get out ahead of the capital project before the street improvement was done, but 
Um, there, we're kind of coming back after the fact. This is a really sensitive issue. Um, it's a sensitive issue if you're annexing, if you're annexing 80 homes, um, and 10 of them are on 41st Street, and because it's a um, existing improved street with a high traffic yep. uh, load, those homes, uh, which I'm, I'm I'm tickled pink for them. They have a different cost of annexation than the other 70 or 70 remaining homes. Yep. Uh, the what makes it a sensitive issue is every car that gets on that high usage street is entering it from Klein Avenue. Uh, so, you know, where do you draw the line as a city if you're gonna if you're gonna start? Uh, I'm not asking you to take away anybody's discount or reduce anybody's cost, but where does that traffic come from? You know, and these, but there again, these are just considerations for any area. Yeah, if, we're uh, not being specific. I'm not being specific. I am in this particular case. I'm <laughs> violating the rules. No, you're all right. You know, because <laughs> I, I, I'm not famous for my political correctness, but, but what I am saying is, is it, it creates a hazard for you. Uh, where's the, you know, traffic studies are important. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying before you change the cost of annexation. Okay. Other task force comments on trigger number four? Well, as you know, there's a lot of these already. So I, do these conversations already take place? I mean, without mentioning a specific property. Um, yeah, some of those, again, go back to our previous uh, process but we don't have a formal policy right now that this would be a trigger that we would identify all of these and we would begin having discussions with each one. It's been kind of a hit and miss. And uh, for example, on West 41st Street, there's a large unannexed area that we haven't initiated discussions with that's adjacent to an approved 41st Street. We have a number on 12th and 57th Street. Yeah, I mean, Street. there's, there's I mean, a number of examples so. around that we have not started discussions with, but okay. with, if this is one of the triggers that we would use, then that would allow us to determine which ones we could begin going out. Are the majority of these properties surrounded by developed or undeveloped property? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mix. I think a lot of them are surrounded to some degree, but not completely. Mm -hmm. But I'm not hearing any uh, opposition to this being a trigger among other triggers. No, I Every, think this would everyone be good comfortable with this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Good opportunity yeah. to start the discussion. Appears to be the case. Um, so now we're gonna we're gonna kind of move to a different qualifier. You know, with that with our flow chart. Remember that there's a number of, of outcomes that you could have once we start talking to property owners. And one of those outcomes could be what we call a pre-annexation agreement. Um, and that pre-annexation agreement can take a lot of uh, forms. Um, in some cases, it could be very specific as far as a timeline of when potential annexation might occur and under what scenario that would happen. Uh, we've done other ones where we've just basically said that with this pre-annexation agreement, we've worked and talked to the neighborhood or to a development, and they've agreed that at this time, uh, for whatever reasons, they're not ready to be annexed for five, 10, or whatever period of time you wanna say. So the example here is that, um, the city's looking to make an improvement to a specific area. Um, it might be, again, a CIP project, but the neighborhood does not have an appropriate or an approximate timeline of when urban services would become available. So if we're doing a, a large infrastructure project, um, you know, maybe it's not the right time to initiate actual annexation but with a pre-annexation agreement that we've done, um, 
probably at least two or three times in recent years. We could at least have that, the, the parameters laid out and right. you're familiar with what that process could be. I, I, I think this, the city should make and the neighborhood should make every possible effort to try to work out the terms of, of the annexation. I mean, the process went well for us. It took lots of years. Yep. I, I mean, I think we had somebody from the city meeting with us at our annual homeowners association every year for 10 years yep. before, you know, because people are busy and they're not paying a lot of attention and they come together for these meetings and um, <coughs> you know, we finally got enough attention and, and it, and, and we did work out at something that everybody was comfortable with. I mean, there's a lot of diverse opinions within our within our neighborhood. So I, I mean, to me, um, uh, every effort, you know, a pre-annexation attempt to reach an agreement almost needs to be at a stalemate before the city should be able to move ahead with with some type of a forced annexation. So the, again, the question that we're asking you today is. Under what conditions would a pre-annexation agreement be appropriate? And maybe this example is not exactly well, what you would recommend. But it, are there are there scenarios where a pre-annexation agreement would be appropriate? See, that's where that's where I was going with the prioritizing and number order. This is our targets in order. You know, prioritize the targets. And I would say anything that uh, to be to uh, initiate discussion, uh, figure out. You know what your timeline on your targets and I'd say three years and you know I'd start mentioning it or doing this and that you guys uh, you guys do a great job when you get out and have the meetings and that I mean it's the explanations are clear and and uh, all that but if I guess what I'm saying is if, if you don't have a timeline on it uh, on when you want to do it um, I wouldn't aggravate anybody if I if, well I'm gonna do it 15 years from now it's down that far in the list I would not bother those people. You know, the five-year people, I would be, I'd be all over them, and the three-year people, I'd be having a meeting every quarter. But, but what are what are the purposes of the meetings if they're not to to reach an agreement on annexation? Right. You know, the purpose again is to explain the, the future growth projections of that area. Uh, if there's any future capital projects in the next three to five years that may impact that area or close to that area. And to, again, just begin the dialogue of, we wanna have some kind of a relationship with those neighborhoods or those property owners so that there's no surprises in the future that, um, or there's an understanding of what their expectations are of either the city is gonna do something or not do something in the future. Right. It just kind of gives everybody a, a, a better comfort level of what the future expectations might be. Right. That's, I just and that's how we use discussions them. discussions should be reduced to an agreement, if at of all some possible. Type, yeah. yeah. And the agreement might be that we're not gonna do anything for right. five years or 10 years. We've done that before. And a lot of it is to inform and teach on the process. Yep. But I think, in, I, at least my opinion is that in certain situations, a pre-annexation agreement can have some value to the city and to the neighborhood. Absolutely. So it doesn't cause any surprises or, you know. And obviously, Director Cooper, in, in this situation with the pre-annexation qualifiers that we're discussing here, we're talking about properties now that are not contiguous or connected to the immediate city. Yep. Voluntary requires you to at least have that connection or to be contiguous to the city. Yes. In this case, this would be something where the city in their five-year CIP plan are, are looking to extend services out to this area and uh, at that point then are looking to the possibility of initiating at least a pre-annexation agreement with that particular group. So it gets back to how do we prioritize where we're going to go out and have a, start having these discussions if we're going to do them at all. Okay. How much beyond five years does the, the planning actually go? I mean, we as counselors see the five-year plan. Is there a 10-year? Yeah. We have 15, a 2040 plan. Our 2040. That the city council has adopted. Yes. And we, we call those a tier map, so every five-year increments is what we call tier one, tier two, 
so the, that, that expected development area within that, that first tier, which is a five-year time frame, is where we typically spend the most time. And so it can actually extend out to that 25-year period, then the 2040, Ultimately, we yeah. adopted that in 15. Yep. And that 2040 plan is based on, again, putting together a future growth area and a timeline of when city services would poss possibly be extended out into those growth areas. How many pre-annexation agreements do we currently have in place? Is it three or four? Three active ones right now. Three active? Three that are in place right now. In place. That are still in effect. Are they considered to be part of the 62 pockets that we've yes. discussed? Okay. Yep. So now we're down to 59. No, I'm just. Okay. Progress, just yeah. like that. Just like that. So what I'm hearing again, and we'll, we'll have a chance to refine this in more detail, so I don't want you to feel like I'm rushing through these tonight, but. Councillor Neitzer, you've got a comment. Okay. Yeah, is that a, is that a, I mean I've looked at it. It looks like it. Is it a binding legal contract between two parties? It's not. It's not a binding legal contract according to the city attorneys, but it's more of a, a memorandum of understanding that here's what potentially could happen in the future. But it does go through city council approval. Have you had some that have extinguished because that area went forward and actually annexed? I. Yeah, two cases where that's happened. And then does I assume that agreement is just goes away. Goes away. Yeah. Were so they I mean, annexed? To, I'm sorry. Oh, it, I'm sorry. Were they annexed to, in accordance to the agreement? Yes. So you followed your part. Right. Okay, and they followed their part. We laid out some time frames and then we laid out what the requirements would be of the property owners, what the requirements would be of the city if it was annexed. So they were it was successful annexation on yep. both parties. What's the longest period of time a pre-annexation agreement has been in place? I think it was 15 years with about 15 years, I think, is the longest that we've gone out. And then my question is, is there a responsibility on the part of the property owner to disclose that there's a pre-annexation agreement if they should sell their property in the meantime? Um, I'll ask Danny Brown if he has an opinion on that. There you go, come on up, Dean. <laughs> Free annexation agreement is normally not recorded against the property. There's no obligation to tell a, a, a purchaser that there is a pre-annexation agreement. That's what I assumed was the case. Yeah. Um, and this might be a question for Councillor Selberg. Uh, are real estate agents generally aware of pre-annexation agreements and these cases is there anything that, that can identifies to that to you i would say in certain areas I, I believe that you know some things i can't speak to every agent in town how schooled they are and what's coming but i mean i've run a, you've come across that on occasion but i don't know that everybody's okay at that completely down where it's coming and, and i know on the question that was just up there does it have to be on your property disclosure and that i've never come across that no. yep. Just a thought, since much of our discussion is centered around communication, it would seem prudent for us as a city to at least pass this information along to the Realtors Association, which could then pass that information along to their um, participating agents. Would, would that be of any use as a Realtor, Councillor Selber? I would think so. It's certainly worth approaching them on it. Yeah. I think, too, that when property owners or when property is transferred from one owner to another, there's no way that we would know that the True. new property owner is aware of that pre-annexation agreement. So that's something that I think we could take a look at how that might, how there might be a better process to keep that uh, awareness going forward. Have, have you had any, it sounds like maybe you had, but maybe I heard wrong. Have you had any agreements between a landowner or a group of properties and neighborhoods saying, for the next 20 years, we're just going to take it off the table. We're not going to discuss annexation. Yes. Both parties. Yeah. We have a timeline that we've done, at least in a couple cases, that said we're not going to initiate any annexation until at least year X. Okay. 
And then it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to annex it at that time, but we're going to come back and review it again. Yeah. We've done that, yes. So I, I think what we're saying is that there's some value to potentially using a pre-annexation agreement as, a, as an option. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to speak for you guys, so, okay. Okay, we've talked about voluntary annexations. We've talked about what triggers the city would use to go out and begin having discussions with property owners. We've talked about what a potential annexation study could be or how that might be utilized. And so now the last outcome would be uh, when would city staff potentially go forward with more of a formal annexation study? And again, this is a process that's identified by state law that if the city thought there was a compelling reason to, to look at initiating an actual annexation, their state law provides that there's a process that you go through. Um, so in this example, the city approaches a property owner or owners about annexation, but they're not interested in becoming annexed. If the city has a compelling reason and the task force might want to give us some ideas of what those compelling reasons might be, then we would follow appropriate state law and move forward with a study to analyze if this property or properties were annexed, what would be the requirements of the property owner, of the city, what would be the financial impact to the property owners, to the city. Uh, all of those things are required by an annexation study. And then, um, ultimately, the city council still has the decision of whether that property would be annexed or not, even after a study is completed. So, uh, what we're asking the task force to come up with some parameters of when we would potentially start working on an annexation study. In other words, you're looking for the Oops. compelling reasons. Yes, what are some compelling, are there any compelling reasons that we would kickstart that annexation study process? In my, in, in my own mind, in my own mind, it's, uh, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but in my own mind, that study, if you have 60 targets, I'd be doing the study on them all right now. And when I've came up with a, and then I would uh, determine if there was a compelling reason or if there was something that that area had to offer the city or this conversely, the city had to offer that area. And that would be, I would prioritize those areas by number. This one is number one based on these, the fact that uh, we need to run a, a huge water line or sewer line right through the center of their area. Uh, and it's stopping the acceptable services of five neighborhoods to the south. Uh, you know, those are, those are things, if you've isolated the six, the areas, the 59, you already got three covered. The, if you've got those 59, and I'm not talking about an official study to the state, but you'd have 90% of that study work done, and you could, uh, in a business-like manner, know what, you could have timelines figured out on all 58 of them, you could have 59 of them, and you'd have priorities and based on your needs, which I know there are many, um, ahead of time. You'd have a time, and then you could actually come up with a reasonable timeline. It might be in de decades or whatever. And then you could go to people with facts instead of, um, you know, if you go out, per, if you send a five-person task force out to review those, if you reviewed once a week, you'd have them all done in a year and then put them in a timeline. If you did two a week, you'd have them done in half a year, and then you would be ahead of the game as far as a study. I think, where, I think where people get uneasy is, well, maybe it'll be this way, or, well, I, you know, we really want to do this, but we're not sure at the time. You know, I, I think that most of these things I think that most of these things can be done um, in a real, and I'm not saying you're not organized, don't misunderstand me, I know you are. But I do think that uh, the study should be done before you target the area. So I would just comment that a st an annexation study is very detailed and very specific. And so the cost estimates that you're gonna put in that study have to be pretty realistic and pretty current. 
And you do, you're doing that when you're actually getting ready to go forward with well, annexation. Well, perhaps maybe, you should call, maybe we should call a pre-state study and abbreviate some of that area because, I mean, a, a visual overview, uh, a knowing what you want to, you know, a general idea of what you want to do. I'm not, I'm, it, and this, I, I knew this was going to come into that, was, was the one that's going to the state has got to be hugely different than, than you going out and looking around at these areas, making an educated well, guess with all your years of experience. State and decide just, which one should be done first. State law just identifies the process that you go through. Okay. But I mean, yeah. it's some, there's some way that you should be able to prioritize. Well, that's kind of where we're asking. Put them in order. If these triggers should be used to help prioritize them, we go out and we initiate the discussions based on the triggers, and that could result in voluntary annexation. It could result in a pre annexation agreement or Again, if, if we discuss these areas with a neighborhood and we've identified that there's some compelling reasons, then we would initiate the study. Move them up on the list then. But that's, have timelines. that's the question that we're throwing back to you. Does, does, the city, does the city conduct the study itself or do you hire somebody to the do The city that? has been doing them in the past. But we only do those when we're, when we're confident that we're gonna go forward with a initiated annexation. What, what are some of the compelling reasons in the past, or what are some examples of compelling reasons that the city's used yeah, in the past? The ones that we've done in the past, we've looked at where properties are um, not being utilized by city water and sewer, and so, but they want to be at some future point, and so we do a study of how that water and sewer installation is going to happen, right. and over what period of time it's going to happen. So, um, we've director. also done a city initiated annexation that involved um, a large group of properties where there was going to be a major trunk line sewer expanded. Those are some of the. Mm -hmm. So, there hasn't been a lot of recent examples that we've done a city initiated annexation of, of either an individual property or a smaller neighborhood, unless they're looking for something from the city in terms of improvements. So, Director Cooper, your first example was when the property owners wished to be connected to yes. city water and sewer? Yep. Okay. When's the last time we had a city initiated I think it annexation? Was a big, I think based on our history map, it was in the 90s or 2000s. It was in the early 2000s. Okay. Because I know uh, the 90s was uh, another big one in the south central portion yep. of the city. So. Comments, task force members. So, Councillor Neitzer. You're, it, I mean, this is really, frankly, let's be honest, this is a $64,000 question. I think this slide is why everybody's here. I mean, in, what it's asking is under what conditions would we forcibly annex, start yes. the wheels turning. There you go. I mean, that's pretty much it. Let me just ask if there was, if you need to run a trunk sewer or some infrastructure through, I don't, think you necessarily have to annex can't you just no. get you just get an easement yes assuming they would grant it yes no so, the property does not have to be annexed so I mean I've been this is a question I've been struggling with from the beginning as I'm trying to think of um, you know what what would be the compelling trigger and I might need a little more time to chew on that you know because I'm thinking of things like for example there's times where there might be eminent domain which I, I don't like it but there might be cases where you know in the public interest we need to put a road through somebody's property and I'm trying to think of you know if there might be a uh, uh, an analogy to city services you know make maybe somebody won't give an easement but then if you annex them if they still won't I does that change anything I mean if they won't give you an easement does it matter whether they're annexed or not I mean do you have to go around them or yeah we have we've had to go around them in the past yeah which is well, not I mean, the most efficient way to do something. This, does annexation solve the problem if you need to run a sewer line through and they say, I'm not giving you an easement? Well, then they can connect to it, yes. If well, they, they can connect to it, but I mean, they're, but they're saying, maybe they're saying, I don't care, I don't want your sewer, yeah. I don't want it going through my property. I don't, I, and that has happened, yes. Okay. In the case so in the past, really, when we have run around, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that, that was one of our additional options versus yep. going through. But obviously, it wasn't an option that was so inefficient cost-wise that the city couldn't do it. Yep. So you're looking for a scenario where 
it would just be cost prohibitive for the city. It would break the bank to, to that do might something. Be one scenario. Oh, yeah. going. But you're right, Councillor. This really comes back to the heart of the whole reason the task force was created, I think, is because we were going out and starting these discussions and the, the question was, are you going to force us all to be annexed, these 62 properties? No, I, I didn't hope I wasn't the, that I didn't, I did not insinuate that. <laughs> no, I'm just. Yeah, but, but, but I, this, and I'll give I you credit. This is a pretty important slide yeah, to, I, I've seen, to think I've about. seen arguments go on in different areas of the city for 10 years and then, and nobody in the city has not initiated a force annexation. So I think, I think the fear monger that's out there and says we're going to have to see a force in annexation in Sioux Falls, um, is probably not the answer. I mean, it's not the truth, but I think that on the other hand, um, going back and here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wear you out with this is, uh, and I don't mean to, but if you know, I don't, you don't need to ask us what initiated it. You know, what you as a city engineer planner, uh, all the years of experience, you're aware of what something that's going to have to be done. That's not uh, that hard to identify and I would, with your skills and your staff. So, I mean, if you've got a, and that would be in the 59 areas when you, you've looked them over, you know, well, this has to be done or the whole thing is going to come to a grinding halt, then that, that area is going to either play ball uh, or, you know, there's going to have to be some alternative reality, you know, so, but uh, that's why I, I think the priority, priority on the front, you, you guys are, you guys are really good about seeing what really has to be done and if it does, if, you know, yeah. So, so I think this is one of the most, I, I think this is one of the most important questions we have to answer for the administration because I don't want to go through the time and the effort of doing a study and doing all of this work and all this consternation to bring it to the city council and then have it be dead on arrival. I mean, that's that's what we're trying to solve is the yep. problem before they have some guidance as to whether or not it's they should even be proceeding with looking at under what conditions would we look to forcibly annex? Well, and that's the, yeah, I th it, w it would be helpful to me because I, I'm struggling with what is compelling to the city. If, mm -hmm. if, you, if you guys, just like the, you did the trigger list, gave us some, some so examples and possible possibilities so, that, so we could consider them individually. Okay. And this, this seems to be, you, you saved the hardest for the last, well, <laughs> which is quite happen? all right. And it's because it, it might be because I'm looking at the clock and we're at 20 minutes to seven and we still need to discuss our Sorry timeline, set a date for our next meeting. So this might be a good point for us to stop and for task force members to give that further consideration. And if you can help us with some of the uh, information that Greg had just requested, uh, then maybe we'll have more success in moving forward with this. Because I do agree with Councillor Neitzert that this, this one is an important one for us to answer if we well, have We appreciate the chance to get through this part of our presentation tonight and, and again, next time we want to focus on a follow-up to tonight's questions and then also start talking about those minimum standards and uh, potential cost options. Correct. Which I think will be of interest to the group as well. Mm. So any other thoughts uh, from task force members ab about uh, moving on from this point and uh, tabling this discussion for right now and uh, giving it further consideration? Mr. Chairman, one question did come to my mind when I was yes. thinking about this between meetings. Sioux Falls is home rule charter, correct? Yes. How does that make Sioux Falls different from another city that is not a home rule charter city as far as your powers and, and, and how that proceeds? In terms of annexation, it doesn't change anything because it's outlined by, it's outlined by st state law. So the so, state law? Yes, precludes our charter. Regardless of yes. your form of government? Yes. Okay. If, if state law was silent to annexations, we could create our own process, but it's not. Okay. Good question. So we can't, in other words, if I, right now state law says you have to have 75%, we could not change that to 50%. Okay, so as um, we had 
guessed last meeting that we would most likely be moving into another meeting beyond what was originally scheduled. So that's going to move us into to August. And I think it would be nice if we could uh, select a date in August now, if we could. So, um, Director Cooper, first of all, would you have um, an idea in in how much time since you've been there's been a number of things requested of you here this evening uh, a minimum number of weeks prior to establishing the next meeting we could do it early. I think we could do it in the next four weeks so early to mid-august would be fine with us early to mid-august okay August 7th. Um, we have we have budget meetings but um, yeah I think by mid-august we could be ready for the next task force meeting. We would have to avoid uh, Tuesday because of city council meetings, and in this case, we're going to be having um, budget hearings as well to the first, eighth, fifteenth, and and I believe a joint meeting with the uh, counties on the twenty second. Um, about like the fourteenth or sixteenth of August. It's a Monday or a Wednesday. Yeah, the seventh, fourteenth would work for me, or the. 16th depends whether you want it Monday or 7th 9th 14th 16th uh, let's see um, 16th would work for me too I have something scheduled that goes might go up until 5 o'clock maybe longer um, about we just throw out the 9th I mean we initially started on Wednesdays it's probably nice to avoid Mondays if we can, because I'm sure, as I had the discussion with somebody earlier, um, that uh, Mondays are often kind of hectic days for a lot of us anyway. So is ninth Monday the ninth? Me. Ninth works for me. Yep. Matt, does that work for you? Yeah. You're sure? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to. And Tina, you? I, okay. So it looks like we've settled on August. The ninth. It's a Wednesday. No, uh, yeah, planning commission's okay. Okay, so then depending upon progress at our August 9th meeting, then we would uh, be looking at uh, taking comments and, and recommendations at, in open house settings uh, in September, providing that we are able to get through the rest of our agenda. Uh, and the rest of the things that need to be discussed. And as Council, or as uh, Director Cooper had mentioned, the next meeting uh, we'll try to focus on where we've left off here this evening, as well as uh, uh, you know what what type of improvements may be required. What are the standards or minimum standards and, and uh, financing options that would be available as well? Okay, any further questions or discussion on? timeline okay that brings us to our public input and we have exactly 15 minutes and what I'm going to ask is uh, and if I would and I'd like to uh, mention this to the good folks of Split Rock we've heard an awful lot from you we appreciate the interaction greatly appreciate the guided tour that we had received uh, here a few weeks ago. I'm not sure that there's a member on this task force that does not understand what your position is. <laughs> so we would request that you direct your comments towards this evening's discussion. That's what's going to be most valuable to this task force moving forward. So if, if, you, if your thought or intention was to go over reasons why you don't want to be annexed, we're well aware. Is there a member of this task force that's not aware of that? I think we're all aware. Well, I think we are well aware of that. Well, your, your positions have been rarely, very, very well represented and, uh, and very orderly and uh, very appreciated. And uh, I think every one of us that was, I know that we all are pretty much are of one mind. So I would, I would encourage you to present on topics that were addressed here this evening. I think that's what I would mostly appreciate. And uh, uh, other task force members' comments? 
Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, I, I think I um, welcome any input, but the biggest thing for me is recommendations, uh, minimum requirements, financial assistance, all those things that we have to get down uh, going forward. It's very clear who doesn't want to be annexed, and uh, um, and I appreciate that, but, but I am clear on that. So that's what I'm hoping to hear. So, Correct. And, I mean, ultimately it's going to be up to you. Um, and we'll, we'll do a better job of indicating that uh, on our agenda in the future, too, with uh, regarding public input on items discussed that particular evening. So, welcome. And um, it looks like there's a number of you, and we're, we are going to end at 7 o'clock this evening. So if you could limit yourself just to a few minutes, because yeah. judging by how many people are behind you, <laughs> that's all we have. Sure, good evening. My name is Jennifer Schmidtbauer, and I'm one of the board supervisors of Split Rock Township, which contains the developments of Split Rock Heights, Pine Lake Hills, and Mystic Meadows. And I just want to offer, you know, you talked about the prioritization of the 62 developments. One way you might want to look at it is what areas are not of highest priority. And I want to say that Split Rock Township is committed to continuing to provide services to our residents for snow removal, road maintenance, funding of the volunteer fire department, and other statutory duties. As a township, we also oppose annexation for the negative impact it would have on our budget as a significant portion of operations is funded by taxes collected on over 300 properties in these areas identified for potential annexation. Later this week, our township intends to pass a resolution formalizing our ongoing commitment to serve these developments, and we'd be happy to provide that resolution to the City of Sioux Falls as an assurance that we'll continue to take care of these residents. Thank you very Thank you. much. Well stated. <laughs> we'll need to get a, an applause meter, I guess. <laughs> Jeff Kirk, Fleet Split Rock Heights. Welcome, Jeff. And th again, thanks for your hospitality. You're welcome. No problem. Um, we're going to do it real quick since we don't have a lot of time. We had a lot more to present to you, but basically we did our homework. We compiled everything into a bill, and that's what you guys have in front of you. Uh, ultimately, what we came up with is anywhere from ninety-five dollars to 230000 You know, what we've seen so far is just bits and pieces over four meetings, five meetings. <clears throat> so... We compiled what we thought was accurate information coming from the city, coming from sources A1, first rate, and that is what we came up with. So that's all. Okay, thank you very much. That was well below the three minute deadline. Hi, Josie Alpers. Um, I was going to say that we're a part of the steering committee and I'm part of the finance subcommittee. That's how we um, are up here. Uh, we wanted to commit uh, to have a survey to evaluate what everyone in our township wanted, not just those who are showing up to the town halls. And so we issued a survey to everyone, mailed it to their homes. Every survey was numbered with uh, Sana, Sonia Hoffman's handwriting. We knew exactly how many went out. Uh, of our township, 76% of the households returned the survey. And plenty of them had more than one, had the, the man and the, and the woman, both the husband and wife or multiple adults in the home um, answer the survey. And so um, this is just some really quick how people feel about the um, quality of the surroundings. Obviously, people are happy. Go ahead. Uh, the next one is, how do we think our septic system is? Obviously, people are very satisfied with septic. This is, how satisfied are you with snow removal? You can see how satisfied are you with the fire protection uh, and with the water quality. Excellent. And then uh, county law enforcement. And then this is the final um, distribution of how satisfied people are with their current services and that's pretty hard to improve upon. Thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> Josie, thank you for your hospitality a few weeks ago and, and also just to let you know that we had received your PowerPoint and we forwarded it to task force members prior to the start of the meeting. Great. Thank you, Ryan Gabauer, Split Rock heights obviously um, but here are the surveys and uh, one of the things that I was going to care over is basically two things some of the highlights Josie talked about the quality of life that we currently enjoy we also want to respect the comments earlier of not going into a deep dive but I'm going to call out 95% strongly opposed annexation 
you know that. However, what you don't know is there were 72 responses or 34% would be forced to sell. Further information, effective as of today, there are currently 196 active homes in the city of Sioux Falls. If you look at our neighborhood, that would force an increase of 38% of homes that would be forced to sell. What's that gonna do? It's gonna flood the market. So it not only affects us, it affects the current residents of the city of Sioux Falls. Nearly two thirds of the residents would be selling their home over a period of time the survey also produced results of. From the survey, when we looked at expenses beyond the expenses of the infrastructure, there was an overwhelming response that 88% would find extreme hardship to pay for the landscaping and the private connection to the city and all the expenses that are gonna go on our own private land. So in recognition of the time, I did have several more comments. I actually um, wanted to read some of the comments, but there's one comment I'm gonna read. I think it hits home. To pay this debt from assessments, we would lose nearly everything we have saved for 20 years. Most importantly, our children's college funds would be gone and leave them with substantial debt of education. Or we would be forced to sell our home for whatever the reason. We would be upside down in our mortgage. And I want to point out 49% of the survey revealed the same thing, that many of us, many of them, would have to also declare bankruptcy. That means a misery for all, the, for all those individuals because of a forced annexation or just simply an annexation. I need to tell you, I am a veteran. I served our country during the Iraq war. I had served it in honor. I was discharged with an honorable discharge. As a Marine, I have to simply ask this task force to ask the council, is this really what we wanna to do to our veterans? I've got a question for the room. How many of you are veterans? I'd like to see you stand up. First off, thank you for your service to our country and our great state, but I need to tell you that this drives the root of why we're here. I fought for my country, I'll fight for my backyard. <laughs> Specifically to your comments of what was just presented today, I, I think we missed the boat. I think uh, there's some additional information that needs to be captured on your triggers. The, the biggest boat I think that was missed is we need to qualify and classify these properties as developed land or undeveloped land. Each one of those will have different triggers, and I think we missed that tonight. Thank you. I think you're wrong on that, I, I, you, and I can tell you why I think that, because I've discussed this. We've all discussed it together. Um, you and I had a conversation prior to the meeting that uh, said that most everything that was said about Split Rock uh, made sense. Um, I'd hate, I wouldn't want you guys to go beyond that because I think you've made your point very well. Um, it's not, uh, we're not here to annex you, we're here to make the triggers, but we do know the difference between developed and rural and rural developments and undeveloped property. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Davis, but does that not also mean though, I think the city, the planning director is looking for triggers for the next step you'd have to agree that those triggers are going to be different between land that's developed or not developed. For example, undeveloped land that has an improved road next to it, does that have a different trigger than land that actually has a fully developed with a working system or we acknowledge a Acknowledge the difference in triggers system. for developed and undeveloped thank land. You. That's what I wanted to know. There should be a difference in triggers. There is a difference. Thank you. Ryan, thank you very much, first of all, for your service to your country and for your comments here. And uh, my thanks goes out to all of our service members, as I'm sure I speak on behalf of the task force as well. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Monica Vischer. I'm from Mystic Meadows. And um, first of all, I want to recommend that when you guys come out with the recommendations to present to the council, uh, I know we're going to have open houses, but I would like to actually have those publicly available prior to the open house so that we have time to discuss them with our spouses, our neighbors, neighborhoods, and so forth, so that we, when we come to the open house, we come prepared with solid information for you. Um, also wanted to let you know that Mystic Meadows also recently completed a survey. 90% of our homeowners uh, participated in this. 96% of the homeowners in Mystic Meadows opposed being annexed. Um, the thing that was most shocking to me that came out of this 
was that 48% of the homeowners said that they would be they would consider selling their home in the near future if the entire cost of the annexation was put upon them. That's almost 50% of the homes in our neighborhood having to be going up for sale. And if split rock data is the same, you know, similar, you, you are going to have a lot of floods of, of, of homes up for sale. So those are just a couple points that I wanted to make. Um, last but not least, Pine Lake Hills and Mystic Meadows, we are joining and we welcome you. And I'd love to set up a time to have you guys come meet us and see our neighborhood and see some of the challenges that we may be facing if uh, faced with a future annexation. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lola Kuhn. My husband and I have lived in Split Rock Heights for the last 26 years. Um, I was supposed to share information that we received from the um, Surveys that were given, I'm going to try to consolidate that because it's kind of beating a dull, dead horse. But um, one comment was that the gentleman was on Social Security disability. His income would, is barely able to keep him going now. He would be forced to sell. Another was saying that he would like to leave something for his child. They, have the, they would lose the house or have to return it back to the bank. Uh, both being in our 90s, uh, the gentlemen and folks said that they live in split, split Rock on a sparse security budget and meager savings. The cost of annexation would wipe us out totally. And as for my husband and myself, we are both retired and raising a grandson. If annexation occurs, both of us will be forced to go back to work. Between the two of our combined careers, we've worked, worked over 90 years already. And so it seems unfair that we would have to go back to work just for annexation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're, you're getting close. Hi. Yes. <laughs> I, first of all, thought I'd reassure you, I don't live in Split Rock. I actually <laughs> don't live in any of the neighborhoods that are on the list, but I know people who are, so I've been kind of coming, finding out the, the way that things work. And I do have some specific thoughts about the process, which is what I know we're trying to find out here. So one of the things that came to mind today is you talked a little bit about the surveys that are done after the plan is in place and it's, it's very costly and it's very in-depth and it's, it has to go to the state and all that sort of thing. I really feel like a short survey as mentioned by some members here right at the beginning of that process just the basics, like your five-year plan, these are areas that we think we might need to annex, they're in little pockets or they're getting close. Just go down with like a five-point thing, but actually visit the neighborhoods. What kind of streets do they have? What kind of sep sewer lines? Where do they get their water? What sort of other amenities do they have? Are they good the way they are? Are they gonna be in trouble in three years? Those things I think would help you plan much better without costing a lot. And maybe in that case, it's a, no, this one is just fine. We can go around it. It's not causing any trouble. Or, oh, this one already has gone around. It's just sitting there. It's just fine, too. Or, no, this one, okay, these people, they have gravel. They have uh, septics that are failing. We need to look at these a little more closely and do it on a more individualized basis to make your five-year plan. And then when you meet with people or neighborhoods, if they're not you know, in a similar area or have similar services or, or criteria there already, if they're not in a similar playing field, split them up. You know, With all of these, I think it's caused a lot more commotion than maybe was necessary if you could have talked with these, this group of people, that group of people, this other group of people probably wouldn't have taken any longer than what this whole process of many meetings has, but it would be a little more individualized. I think people would feel more comfortable that they're being heard and, and that it is specific to them. That's it. Thank you very much for your suggestions. Okay, we're getting close to the seven o'clock hour, so, and I'm, it looks like there's one more, if you can keep comments just to a few minutes, I would like to have both of you address the task fantastic, force. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you, good evening. Thank you again for your open minds and your willingness to listen. Uh, my name is John Brown, I'm a resident of Split Rock Heights. I've been up here uh, once or twice. Uh, you're probably getting tired of that. Uh, I've been tasked with 
presenting the Split Rock Heights Steering Committee's concluding statement. Tonight, tonight you've heard from many different people, average citizens to a township official, all directing us to one conclusion. Forced annexation is a lose-lose. A lose for us and a lose for the city. Not only is there no compelling urgency, but there's no justifiable reason to annex us. Roads, sewer, water, all have already gone around us. There's no need to run any infrastructure through Split Rock Heights to facilitate the city's growth. Our septic systems are superior for the environment, and all our current services are rated very highly by residents, so there's no true benefit for Split Rock Heights nor the city. Preservation of the unique character of Split Rock Heights is an unrecognized market advantage for Sioux Falls in South Dakota, helping the city MSA when competing for new businesses and consequently gaining residents nationwide. Forced annexation will be massively costly to both with no gain for either us or the current city taxpayers who may be stuck with the bill. And on top of that, as you've heard, it's just not right. You've heard the impact when annexing people as opposed to dirt. People will suffer, and that reality will never change with forced annexation. People must come first. We don't want, and I doubt the city wants, to be here again in 10 or 20 years talking about the same issue. I believe 2003, this was a ditto. We need, and the city needs, a permanent resolution. Taking us off the table for forced annexation will eliminate uncertainty for homeowners and for the city, freeing us up to improve our properties and move forward with our lives, eliminating uncertainty for the city such as potential ADA issues that might accompany any kind of annexation later on down that would obligate the city to actually build in certain additional infrastructure, freeze the city budget and planning staff to then focus limited city resources on areas that want or need annexation, helping those communities and the city in the process. We are in the process of preparing a white paper on this subject, and we've been doing it for quite a while now, and would be more than willing to dialogue with the city the city council, the task force, to assist in any way possible to move this issue forward. The bottom line, for our sake and the city's sake, we need a never, no forced annexation ever. Thank you. I will just make one brief comment, and that is out of the realm of uh, or what this task force has been assigned to do here. While that might be a decision made by another group, it's not a decision that is the responsibility of this group. Welcome and thank you for your patience. Oh, and thank you guys for going a little bit longer. My name's Heather Doden, I'm from Mystic Meadows. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all of you guys for your time over these last several months in doing this and allowing us to have a voice and hopefully hearing some of the, our concerns and we hear what you guys are saying and hopefully as this goes things just work out for everybody in the best possible way um, I had a whole list of things but I will email you so in, in respect to what you requested I do have a couple maybe questions comments about what you talked about tonight I think it was under the pre annexation qualifiers um, I think you recommended, Mr. Kiley, um, would it be beneficial to pass on to realtors about potential annexation properties to pass on to their agents? I guess my question is be why, if we haven't done that up to this point, would we start doing that now? And I am really find myself sitting on a fence asking that question because as a homeowner who is potentially looking to sell, it concerns me greatly because I think you're going to undervalue my property by doing that and have people get scared away. Um, as a buyer, yes, it'd probably be something I'd want to know. But with all that being said, I guess my question is, if we haven't done it to this point, why would we start that now? The other thing is, and, and in case I misunderstood anything, I apologize. Um, when you guys talked about, um, with Mr. Cooper, about if there's annexations in the city that, you have to, that they've had to build around, and I think there's been a couple, um, he said, and you made the comment, I believe, um, unless it was cost prohibitive to the city. So should those annexation situations come up, I guess my question is regarding the citizens and the people, you know, I get the city has a budget and things have to be cost effective for them, but you know, we're all single family residents living out there trying to make ends meet. And 
doing the right thing day after day and paying our bills and paying our taxes and this kind of thing upsets the apple cart. I mean, to this point it hasn't because, I mean, it's just a discussion. But as the ball starts to roll, um, there are a lot of people that are going to be faced with financial, hard financial decisions. And someone mentioned today a discussion we had last night. For a lot of us, it's our kids' college funds and retirement plans and things that, you know, we have set here. Um, and I am just going to touch on one thing because of that. Uh, I think at meeting two, you guys talked about if, if, for example, the city would throw the whole ball at you, you know, curb gutter, all that. Um, there could be a special assessment for people with disabilities and the elderly, or like a cost containment. But, but that also is where my question lies for the rest of us who don't fall in either of those categories and who are yet trying to raise families and make a life and be good citizens in general. So um, anyway, so those were just my comments and, and thoughts on the things that were said tonight. And I don't know if you have any comments back. Thank you very thank much. You. And your points are well taken, too. Thank, thank you. you. Well, now we have a, a date for our next meeting, August 9th, and it's a Wednesday. Uh, so this meeting is adjourned. Everybody have a nice evening.